I'll try. Another no. cool day in the North Country, December 18th, 2009, at the Angel Center on the campus of Plattsburgh State. Sylvie Bodro, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. It's Doctor, been... it's great to see you once again after lo these many months. How many shows did we do? Three? Four. Three or four yes. shows. Yes. We... Many you, moons ago. We talked about Canadian names and all things Canadian-American and French-Canadian and American. And now, here we are toward the end of 2009, it's about time we got together again. It sure is, and I've been, I've been busy, so... I know you've been busy. Before we started the camera, you told me you did nine lectures? Six. Six? Oh, that's wonderful. And yes. you, you were pretty busy in 2009. It was a big year, yes. And you know why, and your audience knows why too. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It was a tremendous year. Yes. We had great fun anticipating the quadricentennial. Most of our audience learned how to spell quadricentennial. <laughs> that was a challenge. <laughs> and we covered uh, a number of events. Some for us were a little disappointing because we just couldn't stir up the public interest that mm. we wanted. Because it's a big deal. Yes, Isn't it a big yes. deal? Yes, it, it should have been a big deal, or it was a big deal. And so we had fun. We covered a lot of the events for Hometown Cable, and our audience got to see things with a perspective that many people didn't get the chance to do. And when we heard we were going to be here with you today, there was an extra little <laughs> Twitter of excitement. Yes, because well... Because you've spent a lot of time thinking and talking about this, haven't you? I have, and the, I think the reason why you haven't had seen me on your show for, I think, almost a year, or if not more, is because I was doing research uh, leading up to uh, my presentations that I was going to give in 2009. So I had to go around and collect all the material. I had to do, like, secondary reading about what, what it meant, what all these things meant, and put it all together. So... It took me a while to do it, but now I'm ready, and I have about a hundred slides to show you. Do you, you really? Um, I don't know if we'll get through a hundred, because, you know, that might be we, pushing it. Remembering the shows we've done in the past, the best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> Go awry. Uh, well, yeah. because we just talk a lot, and we, we were so interested in yes. the things we were doing. We never finished the topic, but my... Hue and cry has always been, leave them hungry. Yes, yes, so leave them asking for more. <laughs> asking for more. Was this a fun thing for you? Was it a good quest? It was an awesome quest. Um, I went down to the state archives in Albany and looked at stuff that they had there. I went over to U University of Vermont, special collections, found wonderful treasures there. Uh, here at Plattsburgh State, in our special collections, looked at the Hugh McClellan papers. He, oh, he's, the yes. guy, he's the guy who built the statues. What a, what a prolific guy. Yes, what an amazing oh, North God. Country resident. Um, almost inspirational. And then I also, I also looked at stuff that was on the Library of Congress website. Um, I basically went everywhere that I could go that could have possibly been involved in this um, great tercentenary, uh, looking at what happened um, in upstate New York and in Vermont a hundred years ago. So like a hundred years ago they celebrated the discovery of Lake Champlain or the, th the 300th anniversary of the discovery of Lake Champlain. And what I found was that it was probably the biggest um, public commemoration in upstate New York or in this region or in the Champlain Valley. It was a really big deal. Um, and one of the things that made my quest really uh, rather daunting was the fact that the tercentenary was a week-long celebration held uh, in July of 1909, and uh, President Taft came uh, to be part of the celebration, which really gave it a kind of national and international scope. And uh, basically, he went from Crown Point to Ticonderoga to Plattsburgh, uh, then crossed by ferry over to Vermont, and then um, the, the tercentenary continued at Isle Lamotte, but President Taft wasn't part of the Isle Lamotte. He had to go back to Washington because they were passing the tariff legislation and they needed oh, him. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. It was, yes. Interesting. Wh while he was here, like the whole tariff thing was bubbling up in Washington. Sure. And so he had to, he had to rush back. Um, so the president was here, but the thing is the tercentenary was not, it, unlike, see what's really interesting is that in 1908, Quebec City uh, celebrated 
its 300th anniversary, because in 1608, that's when Champlain decided sure. that Quebec would be the, you know, the, 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 the center of French uh, uh, administration in the New World. So, so Quebec City had a big party in 1908, um, but it was only one city, whereas what happened in, in the United States was we also had a big party a year later, but it took place in many different locales. So this is why my research took me to so many different places. So we probably didn't match uh, at the, the 1909. We probably didn't match it in 2009. Um, probably not. I'm going to leave that up to your, you and your uh, uh, audience. You can judge by this presentation if you think which, which one was more uh, imposing. Now you knew something about this before you started all this research, but you had a cram. A oh. lot of reading and investigating. I sure did. You had to be a real detective. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, like finding the material is not that difficult. Or you know, like you do it, you know, slowly. It's kind of a plotting thing. You know, you take a day. You go to you go to you go to Burlington, spend the day scanning material in their special collections. So like you gradually accumulate things over time. I think the thing that also took a lot of time for me was like figuring out, okay, this happened 100 years ago, but my, my question was like, so what? Or like, what does this mean? So, so I had to do a lot of, you know, what historians call like theoretical reading. Oh, sure. And I had to look at the idea of collective memory. What happens when a society remembers its past collectively? when they choose to honor a certain citizen or a certain moment in their history, why is that important? Or what happens at, at that moment? And when I begin to look into the theoretical literature about collective memory, no surprise, it turns out to be oceanic in its scope, <laughs> of right? Course. Um, That's the word. Yeah, there's just so much of it. It's a huge, huge field. It's like a global field. Uh, people in Japan look at their collective memory. People in Germany are, you know, uh, invested in it. Uh, any any society really thinks about itself in terms of its past and tries to imagine, you know, what what the lessons of its past are. So, so I I began to like that. That was I think the most challenging part of my you know quest, but it was also the most rewarding because I feel like I really got into understanding what happened 100 years ago and I can now look at the pictures or show you the pictures and I can actually tell you not only who's in it and what they're doing but I can also say like why does this matter? It's more difficult when you're going back 100 years because you don't have the luxury of video to watch or even motion pictures. Um, there were a few sound recordings made at that time. You probably didn't get a chance to hear any of them. Did you? Um, there are some amazing things on the Library of Congress website. Uh, video, uh, like video clips of this period. And you can get, um, I th you, you get video but not audio. Um, I think there are some audio recordings of like President uh, Theodore Roosevelt speeches and you'll get like video of like a submarine or, or a submarine going up, you know, going into New York Harbor or, you know, President Taft going into Panama, things like that, vintage stuff. So you can actually see the motion and the way people move and like the kinetics of it, but you can't really get the sound. Yeah. And there was no, there was no uh, recording of the New York State tercentenary, um, unfortunately. So mostly reading, looking at pictures. Yes and then trying to throw it all up in the air and come down with a presentation that makes some sense yes, and yes. covers the subject. Yes, and what I'm going to present to you today is um, only one chapter of what I, like, I basically got so much material together that I could envisage writing, or I've written a book, or I have the draft of a book, where I, I have a chapter for each place, you know, one for Crown Point, one oh, for Ticonderoga. Oh, wonderful, no kidding. Yeah, one for Plattsburgh, one for <laughs> Burlington, and one for Isle of Mott. So I'm kind of showing how in each place there was a different story to be told. And so I think that makes a really kind of nice, nice narrative. So when we come back, <laughs> you will have that book all published. Oh, no, I won't. Don't say that. You're, you're going to jinx me. You're going to jinx me. I won't jinx you. I promise you. you, you I know, know you, you know what they it. say. You know what they say in rural Quebec, right? What? There's an old expression that you, you know, um, don't, 
Don't sell the skin of the bear before you've killed it. Oh my goodness, I've never heard that one before. It's, it's just an old French <laughs> But it makes perfect yeah. sense, doesn't it, based on the traditions? Yes. All right, so you got, you so, brought a hundred slides. This is only of Plattsburgh, too. Yes. Imagine, imagine, if I have a hundred for Plattsburgh, I have a hundred for each other place, too. So that's maybe like 800 slides. I'm sorry I missed all your presentations. <laughs> but this is going to um, be fun today. Yes, Gordy was there for the Isle of Mott one, I think. Um, I think. Calvin yeah. was there. Oh, sorry, Calvin was there, sorry, yes. Yeah. Right, you, you weren't, but Calvin was, yeah. I'm not but sure we did cover out. a number of events, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. And we talked about the 1909 events uh, in some of our interviews. But now we're going to get the full, comprehensive, the and definitive report. <laughs> the really big show. The really big show. So let us begin. We may take a moment to uh, adjust the color, Very the, good. the darkness and light on the screen, and then we'll start our slideshow, okay? Very good. Sounds good. All right, doctor, let us begin. All right, let's begin. Well, the, t the title of the presentation that, I, that I've uh, given locally is called The Never To Be Forgotten Celebrations, Plattsburgh's 1909 Tercentenary of the Discovery of Lake Champlain. So the, the, the little catchphrase, the never to be forgotten celebrations, that's from a line in Father Marcel Goutin's recollection of the Champlain Tercentenary. So he was writing in 1916. He was there in 1909 and he, he wrote and he said this, these were the never to be forgotten celebrations. I thought it was an interesting title because it, it raises the issue of, in his mind, this would never be forgotten. By him, but see, the interesting thing is it was never forgotten by him, but one could argue that 100 years later, it has well and truly, it, oh had, it goodness, had been yes. forgotten. Absolutely. It was relegated to like the dustbin of history. Oh, sure. Yeah. As so many things are. Yes. And my, my first contact with the subject was here in Special Collections of Plattsburgh State. There was a two volume commemorative edition that the state of New York put out. And, you know, it had photographs and it had like the speeches and it was really quite voluminous. It was like two big phone books. I've seen it, yes. Yes. So I looked at that and that got me started. Um, and uh, so what I'm trying to do is show how these celebrations were forgotten, but I'm trying to revive them in terms of bring them back to public attention. So the first thing I did was find out when they started planning this great celebration. And I found out that the, the planning be began in April of 1907. Um, and Senator Hill made a resolution in the New York State Assembly um, in which he um, called for uh, the commemoration of the discovery of Lake Champlain. And um, this picture that you see behind me is just a collective image of the New York State commissioners who were uh, chosen to be part of this uh, great planning, uh, planning for this great event. Um, and I'll tell you who all these men are later on, but right here you can just see them, um, see their pictures. Um, so these were the men that were put in charge of bringing about a commemorative event uh, starting in 1907. So it took them two years to plan this event um, and they really got intensely, the, the planning sort of built up to a crescendo and by about March of 1909 it was going full tilt. So the commissioners were, uh, they were empowered to organize this event, this week-long uh, celebration. They were also given a more difficult task which was to leave some permanent markers. Um, they, they were also given the task of, you know, creating monuments to Champlain in the valley. So that, that opened up another aspect of my research, which was not just the events themselves in the summer of 1909, but then the attempt to um, get some permanent legacy of this tercentenary, which was to create like great monuments to Champlain or, or monuments to history in the Champlain Valley. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's a whole other subject in a way. It's, a, it's parallel, but it's almost, it's almost a different subject. So if you look at the uh, legislation that was passed in 1907, you know, in, pa you know, in uh, creating this commission, I looked at that to find out what it is they felt was important to celebrate, what was worth celebrating. And the first thing they were celebrating was the Champlain Valley itself. Um, and in, that, in the uh, legislation, they talk about the Champlain Valley as, quote, a highway for the passage of war parties and of armies and of the messengers of peace, of civilization and of commerce. So it was, all, it was all about the military history of the valley, but it's kind of interesting in 1907 that they're also kind of calling for peace, that you know, 
the military stuff was part of the past, and there's a sense that in 1909, we have, the last time we fought the British on Lake Champlain was in 1812, 1814. It's been about a century uh, of peace, and so now maybe what we should talk about also is you know, the, the peaceful uh, uh, nature of the valley. So the commission was created at a time when America was in the full, full flush of something that historians refer to as a pageant craze. Uh, Americans were, you know, really uh, enamored with the idea. I mean, this is a time before radio. It's a time before television. It's a time before videos, DVDs, uh, you know, uh, uh, video games or, you know, Xbox or um, all kinds of things where you can, you know, creatively express yourself. So people were interested in getting dressed up like historical figures and having pageants and reenacting significant moments of their past and taking photos of it. So this was a real huge craze at the time, uh, especially amongst the more educated uh, members of American society. So the report notes uh, not just the pageant, well, the pageant craze, but it notes the influence of various other public commemorations, such as the celebration at Yorktown in 1881, which was 1881, what were they, celebra what were they commemorating at, at Yorktown in 1881? Tell me. The Battle of Yorktown yeah. in 1781, so the hundredth anniversary sure. of that really significant revolutionary mm -hmm. battle. Uh, there were there was also the centennial of the inauguration of George Washington as the first president of the United States in 1889, um, and that this is all things that had happened before 19, 1909. Then there was the historic phases of the Philadelphia Exposition of 1876, the Columbian Exposition at Chicago in 1893, and the St. Louis Exposition of 1904. So all these things had dazzled the American collective imagination, and the, the tercentenary commissioners were inspired by these great celebrations to do something you know, at, at the same level. So the, the report also noted uh, the impact of the 1908 Quebec tercentenary under the direction of the well-known uh, uh, manager, Frank Lassell. He was a graduate of Oxford University, and the commission report says that this Quebec tercentenary was, quote, such a success that the people of Vermont and New York concluded that a celebration less pretentious and less spectacular, but still realistic enough uh, to picture the discovery and aboriginal life of the Champlain Valley and extensive enough to recall some of the stirring events which have made Lake Champlain famous in two hemispheres, quote unquote, in the new world and in the old world. Um, the introduction to the report says that love of country is born of a knowledge of its institutions, its traditions and history, wherein are revealed the lives of its people and their heroic achievements. So this is the thing that the commissioners were aiming for. They wanted to instill a sense of the love of one's country and, and an idea of, of like how stirring the past events had been. So interestingly, uh, the state of Vermont uh, was more involved in this than even New York was, even though Champlain in theory never really set foot in Vermont or most of his activities were on this side of the shore. So the state of Vermont took the first official action, action creating its own tercentenary commission in 1906. So eventually what they did was they collaborated. The two sides collaborated. So it became a kind of bi-state um, commission. Mm -hmm. um, and this caused a lot, quite, quite a bit of tension because, especially when it came down to creating the monument of, for Champlain, there would be a, a big debate between, of course, Vermonters wanted it to be on the Vermont side of the lake, and New Yorkers wanted to be on the New York side of the lake, so they couldn't agree. And that's in part why, you know, the tercentenary took place in 1909. The monuments only got built uh, in, in three years later in 1912 because they, they haggled over this. Um, so there's a good story behind how it got located yeah, in Crown sure. Point. Yeah, there's always a good story <laughs> when, when you start digging a yeah. little bit. So let's go, let's go ahead and look at what it was that was being celebrated uh, in 1909. Um, and do you recognize this picture at all, Gordon? Oh, yes. Have we not seen it more than 20,000 times <laughs> in the last year? Yes. And for many years before that. And where have you seen it? Uh, we've seen it everywhere. Yes. Um, in, in, have you seen this, the color version of this, over at the Clint, Clinton Community College? Yes. 
Oh, and I think maybe, is it City Hall too? Uh, not City Hall, it, it, it could be both. Clinton, I know Clinton has it, yes. Clinton has a, a huge, like, oh, yes. uh, larger than life oh, wall yes, size of course. one. Yes, yeah. and it's color. Um, so this is a rather, uh, like, romantic image of Samuel de Champlain. It certainly is, um, isn't it? Yes, no one really knows what the man looked like, but um, this, is a, it, this is as good, good a version as any. Uh, it kind of looks like he's somewhere near Ticonderoga, which is probably really where he fought his battle. It's a very romanticized image. We don't really, Champlain didn't leave any, any image of himself, so uh, the image that we have of him is, is it's an imaginary portrait. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so here we have this lovely picture of Champlain. Um, and so the question arose as to what they were celebrating in 1909. I had to somehow be specific about, or get to the, you know, the, the, the kernel of it. And it became really interesting when I realized that what was being celebrated kind of depends on, well, who you, who you talk to. Vermont might have had some things to celebrate. New York might, might have had something to celebrate. Uh, the French, French Canadian emigrants in the North Country might have had a different spin. They might have emphasized Catholicism in, in America. So maybe Native Americans might have had their own view on, what, on why this was happening and what it was all about. Sure. So it became really interesting on the level of trying to figure out all these different you know, points of view and, and, and that it wasn't just one thing that was being celebrated. It depended on what, where, if you were in Ticonderoga, you might be celebrating Ethan Allen. If you were in, you know, uh, if you were over in Isle Mott, you might be celebrating Father Jogue, uh, the great, you know, Jesuit uh, martyr. So it, you know, it really depends. It's it's like a kaleidoscope of reasons. So I've tried to figure out some of them. So let's look at what was being celebrated. First of all, Champlain, the man himself, um, in 1909, he celebrated as a man of virtue and courage, and Americans embrace him as a uh, as a great citizen. So this is what was, I found really interesting, was that Champlain, up until 1909, was always considered a French Catholic hero or a Canadian hero, because he is the founder of Canada as we know it. He founded Quebec in 1608, and ever since he, you know, persisted with a kind of dogged, you know, dogged uh, stick with itness. He persisted in keeping that colony alive such that the French presence has flourished since 1608. Mm -hmm. um, so sh that Champlain would be a Canadian hero is not surprising. He's like, you know, the founder of the nation. What was interesting in my research was that I noticed that Americans really didn't pay much attention to Champlain until 1909. You had Francis Parkman, who talked about him a little bit, the great 19th century historian. And you had some Catholic historians who, by the 1880s, were beginning to write books about great Catholic heroes in America, and Champlain would be one of them. But um, ordinary Americans did not really embrace Champlain as an American hero until 1909. And you can see by the publications that are coming out that increasingly there are books that are like dedicated to Champlain the man as an American, a full-blooded American hero, as a founder of New York State. And when you think about the fact that like Henry Hudson was coming up the Hudson River in the summer of 1609 and Champlain was coming down the lake that now bears his name around about the same time, historians say if like if either of them had stuck around longer they might have actually met. So there's this kind of cosmic you know coincidence yeah, sure. oh, yeah. yes. that you know like New York City had a big party in 1909 that we, we weren't really part of where they were celebrating the 300th or 400th anniversary of the Hudson River or Henry Hudson's discovery of of Manhattan Island. So there's the there's the downstate foundation story and then there's the upstate you know foundation story. So in 1909 Champlain becomes he, he sort of gets, uh, what's the word? Uh, he, he gets drawn up into the pantheon of great American heroes like George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or you know, any number of these, these great men. So it's all about Mr. Champlain and uh, perhaps the fact that he's a Catholic is not quite so upsetting to Americans in 1909 because there's been a lot of Catholic immigration to America. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, so uh, it's a time when Americans are becoming religiously more tolerant and they can embrace Champlain as a Christian, 
and as a hero, you know, and as a man of great courage and great, you know, moral integrity as well. So it's all about Champlain. Then it's also, this is what's interesting, the tercentenary also becomes a story of noting and marking 300 years of history in the Champlain Valley. So 300 years of European occupation. So it's really clear that you know the Champlain Valley has always been there and it wasn't always called Champlain Valley, but 1609 marks the beginning of the European history of the valley or the, or the written history. So in the context of that, all the communities that participated in it were called upon to highlight how their locality had contributed to that European history. So what you have is this layering. You have like the French history of the valley, then you have the, Brit the British history of the valley after the conquest, and then you have the American history in the valley. So, any, so pretty much any event that was of major consequence in the Champlain Valley, and as you know, there were many of them, any one of those events is now going to be uh, highlighted as part of this commemorative event. And that's when it be opens it up to all kinds oh, of sure. things, yes. Um, all right, so that's an an another, another, another part of it. Uh, the report says that it was thought that such a, such a celebration might also very properly commemorate some of the thrilling events of state, national, and international import that occurred in the Champlain Valley during the two centuries following its discovery, for no other part of our domain is richer in historic lore. So you know how they talk about the Champlain Valley as being like, or the Sh Lake Champlain as being America's most historic lake? It's in 1909 that Americans really fully come to that realization of how much history was written on its shores. So I think that's really interesting. All right, the third possibility is that the tercentenary, that the real star of the tercentenary was the lake itself. Ta-da. Yep. It was now, now, you've been out on the lake. Um, Calvin's been out on the lake many times, I'm sure. And when you're out on the lake and you're looking onto the shores on either side, it's quite magnificent. Absolutely. Especially if the sun is setting or if oh, there's some sure. kind of clouds in the sky. It is a really incredibly beautiful lake. And I'm not sure if we could go as far as to say, is it the most beautiful lake in America? We'll vote for that. I'll vote for that. I'm, voting. Yeah. I'm giving it a thumbs up. I'm voting for that. Sure. The combination of the mountains and the water on both sides, and the, dramatic, the dramatic views, it's really quite spectacular. So um, it was a celebration not only of the historic interest of the lake, but of its beauty, the beauty of the landscape itself. Um, as historian David Glasberg put it, the place is the hero. Good, I like that. The place is the hero. Yeah, yeah I, I love that. I love that line too. Um, that, you know, that the landscape itself might have heroic qualities. So you're not just celebrating Champlain, the man's historic qualities, not, and not just maybe Ethan Allen's heroic qualities or all the other historical figures that, that had something to do with you know, shaping the history of this region. The lake itself has heroic qualities. Yeah. That's a neat, yeah, that's a neat idea. See, it was worth me taking my time off to do some reading. Yes, I love it. <laughs> right? I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So, uh, by I'm going to examine this, the collective imagery that that was presented during the week long celebration, and we're going to try to figure out what this uh, or this um, um, event meant. Uh, to its organizers, and the organizers, as we're going to see, belong mainly to the Anglo-American elite. Um, we'll see that in a minute. And the focus will be on showing ha on how, through the use of pageantries, parades, uh, orations, and military exercises, the Champlain Tercentenary, it's, what it tried to do is it sought to mold a collective civic culture that all Americans could share. So it wasn't only for the people of the region, it was for all Americans. It was to teach some very important collective lessons. All right, let's go, let's go ahead and look at uh, the picture of the commissioners themselves. Um, and the Champlain commissioners met, they used Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh was, I think, the focus of the tercentenary. It was the focus. Because it was considered the good, it was a larger town and it was considered a strategic point from which you could go to all the other places. You could cross the lake to Burlington, you could go down to Fort Tye, you could you know, go up to Isle of So here are 10 of the members of the New York Champlain Tercentenary Commission. 
uh, and they're visiting Plattsburgh on one of their many tours of inspection. They had to come up here and look at the land and figure out where the Indian pageant would be and where the military parades would be and where the president's speaking stand would be set up and, you know, what it was that would be celebrated, where, you know, how to decorate the parade route, a lot of, like, nuts and bolts details. So, uh, Gordy, undisclosed location, you don't recognize it, do you? I do not. No. Uh, and I don't think anyone does, because, you know, it's a clapboard building. Um, other than the fact that we know it's in Plattsburgh, and I'm figuring this must have been about the 4th of July, because if you look at the top, there's like bunting on the porch. There's some kind of draped. It's a good guess. Yeah. So they're sitting, yeah, it is, a, it is exactly that. It's a guesstimate. Um, but I know who the, I can tell you who the men are, because I spend so much time on the subject that I, I would be remiss if I didn't know these men's names. So from left to right, uh, now basically the commission was set up to represent various uh, counties in upstate New York um, and have a kind of a good mix of counties. Um, and this is only the New York State Commission. So from left to right are uh, James Foley from New York City. There's a couple of New York City guys. They might have been guys who had local roots who moved down to the city and make their money in a, well, on Wall Street and you know still have local roots but now live in New York City. So James Foley uh, on the extreme uh, left uh, from New York City. The man with the big handlebar mustache sitting next to him is none other than Louis Lafontaine, the one and only Franco-American delegate from Champlain, New York. Uh, next to him is James Shea uh, of Lake Placid, of the great family of Olympians. Um, and next to him is Walter Witherby from Port Henry. Uh, then you have William Weaver uh, of Peru, New York. Uh, Wallace Knapp of Moores uh, in upstate, up in, lo, close to Plattsburgh. And then you've got Henry Hill, who was the secretary of the commission. He was from Buffalo. He was from way out, um, out west mm. in our state. Our state has a west. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's a big state. It sure is. <laughs> yeah. Um, next to him is John Booth of Plattsburgh and Ju Judge John Riley, also of Plattsburgh. Not pictured in the, this photo is Howland Pell, uh, who's the owner of Fort Ticonderoga, and he's from New York City, and James Frawley, also from New York City. So it's important to note that these commissioners are planning the tercentenary, but they're also planning the building of the monuments. And as I said earlier, one of the reasons why it took so long to actually build the monuments was because each of these men lobbied for the monument to be built somewhere in their county. Um, especially Essex and Clinton had a struggle over where it should be. And the haggling led, led to a long struggle in which they debated the location of the future monument. And they also had to deal with the Vermont Commission's wish to have the, lo the monument located on Vermont soil. So when President Taft came in 1909, he actually scolded the commissioners for not getting their act together, kind of like President Obama is scolding uh, the United Nations uh, Copenhagen uh, group for not getting their act together. You know, you're squabbling. <laughs> you should be. Yeah. You should be agreeing. So there's more to be said about that squabbling and the, the monuments, but we'll leave that off for now. Um, right. Let's go to the next picture, which is the uh, commissioners in some undisclosed location in a field somewhere outside of Plattsburgh. Um, and I kind of like the picture because it kind of shows how they were, you know, uh, looking around at the, at, the lo at the landscape and figuring out where things would go. And this picture, unlike the one previous, the man with the bowler hat on the extreme right here, is, he's the, uh, the pageant master uh, who's going to organize, uh, organize the really big show. Um, his name was uh, Mr. Armstrong. He's got a bowler hat, uh, and he came from England, and I think he brought a box of bowler hats for all the commissioners. Oh, I do think, really think so. Yes, I think he I did. I love it. Yes, because there's a picture of him in Ticonderoga, and they're up on a hill, and they're all wearing bowler oh. hats. You know, and it just seemed odd that they would all be wearing bowler hats at that point. I just want to point out to you that the commissioners, most of them are wearing Panama hats. And you know why, right? Because in this period is when they were building the Panama oh, Canal. Sure. And the workers on the Panama Canal would come back to America with these straw hats, and it created a, a style that everyone wanted to have a Panama Big hat. Time, sure. Yeah, so it's kind of neat to see. You'll see in all the pictures that in the summertime, the men, the men wore Panama hats, and in the wintertime, they wore uh, bowler hats. So maybe this was in the springtime when it was still a bit cool. And maybe that is the area of Wilcox Dock. I think it is. 
I would look, guess. Look at the, in the background there. Yes. It looks yes. like it's flooded in the spring. Yeah. And that's the Wilcox extension back yeah, there. It could be. It could be. My guess. Yes, me too, me too. So here they are in another pose, uh, look, looking at the lay of the land. Well, to, I think to understand the significance of the tercentenary, you have to understand the social class and educational background of the, of the organizers. The commissioners were selected uh, mainly because they belonged to the Anglo-American elite. They came from prestigious families, they were well-educated, and they exhibited the kind of genteel culture that was considered superior to the mass culture of ordinary Americans which in the progressive era was being commercialized, commodified, and quote unquote, Barnumized, um, as one, <laughs> as one <laughs> critic put it. Oh yes, right? of course. The Barnum Circus, oh, right? E.T. Barnum. Yes. Yep. This idea that Americans were imbued with some kind of crass kind of popular entertainment and circus sideshows and, you know, uh, trapeze artists and, you know, meaningless, mindless, Culture. Does this sound? It sounds familiar, doesn't oh, it? Oh, sure does. <laughs> it's like the critiques they make today of video oh, games, yeah, and yes. yeah. So they wanted to, you know, propagate the values of perhaps more educated and genteel culture, uh, and that's why they were uh, uh, interested in these uh, commemorations. So the forces of, it, of around about 1909, the forces of industrialization, urbanization, and physical mobility were fast changing the American landscape. And these men saw themselves as custodians of tradition in a rapidly changing world. Um, all of them held positions of influence in local, regional, or state institutions. And as such, they were given the role of shaping the aesthetic and moral standards of the day. Right, um, so Gordy, I'm with you. This is Wilcox, this is Wilcox Dock. And then I have another picture of the commissioner's visit here in Plattsburgh. Oh, look at the car. Isn't it great? <laughs> oh, I have oh, to show I it just because it. of the car. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, it's, this is called a touring car because uh, it holds a lot of passengers and it's like the 1909 version of the minivan. <laughs> Right? Wood but spoke wheels. Wood spoke wheels. Yeah. Um, and we were trying to figure out is this, whether this was a lozier or not. Because it doesn't have the famous lozier crest on the front. So we don't really know, but I'll show you a lo lozier later. Um, but yeah, here are the same commissioners on a road, st road stop during the, the Plattsburgh tour. Um, every detail of the upcoming celebration was minutely planned. And um, in, the words, in the words of David Gl Glassberg, these men had in their hands the power to shape the collective civic consciousness. Uh, Glassberg notes in his story of American, his study of American historical pageantry, he's got a really gw great quote that I would like to read at length. Quote, voices for genteel culture worried that different ethnic, class, and regional backgrounds undermined the extent to which local residents shared the, shared the values customarily trumpeted from the speaker's platform on holidays. The furious pace with which Americans move from town to town, the beginnings of what threatened to become a flood of largely non-English speaking immigrants, the rapid rise of explicitly working class organizations such as the Knights of Labor, the explosion of vulgar commercial amu amusements which pandered to the lowest common denominator of mass taste, not cultivated judgment, seemed only to underscore the disintegration of a responsibly led common civic culture. So see, I'm trying to get at what these men were promoting. Uh, yeah. A common civic culture that would be high in tone, mm -hmm. that would be like, you know, educated and refined, as opposed to debased and coarse, yes. So that's really cool. All right, uh, so the commissioners came to Plattsburgh, they're planning the big party, and I wanna show you in my next slide, and I wanna show the audience, the most spectacular picture of the Hotel Champlain in its heyday. It's a picture that will really give you a sense of how much was put into the planning of this celebration. You're gonna see it decorated as you've never seen it before. Oh, isn't that great? Isn't that a great what picture? A shot, yeah. What a shot. Um, this, I was so thrilled when I found this picture, I got like goosebumps because I'd never seen anything like this. Oh, yeah. And I just love the way they've got all the bunting on oh, the hotel. Oh, wonderful, yes. And the Chinese lanterns on the front lawn uh, illuminated for the tercentenary. And uh, basically, this was the most uh, prestigious hotel in, on Lake Champlain, as you know, with the magnificent location overlooking the lake. 
This is, the whole hotel was set aside for the commissioners and their guests. The president would be housed on a houseboat uh, on, on the lake, uh, but the guests would all be here. So it was really put off limits to everyone else. So they kind of booked the whole hotel in advance. Um, and, it served as the, and it also served as a headquarters for the commissioners when they regularly visited uh, Plattsburgh. Um, the presidential party, Governor Hughes, the governor of New York at the time, and official guests were to be housed in this elegant Hotel Champlain, uh, all of it being reserved for the, deli the, the guests. So my next picture shows us uh, what tercentenary guests might have looked like. And I noted in my study that the fact that, that the elite visitors to the tercentenary were housed on Bluff Point, far from the city, in an, in an exclusive hotel reminds us of the fact that though the public celebration was used to foster a collective culture of democracy and egalitarianism, there were nonetheless real social classes in progressive America and many ways were used to shelter them from the bustling crowds of ordinary tercentenary celebrants. The hotel was off limits to the general public and ensured its own tercentenary program for its distinguished guests. The Hotel Champlain's physical distance from, from and isolation from the city of Plattsburgh guaranteed that the distinction between rough and respectable would be maintained. So here are the respectable guests sitting on Bluff Point. You can see the little, uh, you can see the little boathouse off on the corner. Of course. Uh, can you see the palm, the little palm potted plant in the back background? <laughs> yeah. So quite, quite a lovely photo. Um, Showing, uh, showing the respectable guests at the hotel. So the city, the commissioners planned to decorate the city and the whole North Country area with uh, rather remarkable uh, decorations. So Gordon, the tercentenary of 1909, it coincided with the 4th of July. How convenient. So let's just say this was the biggest, grandest 4th of July that the area has ever seen, because it lasted for a week. Yeah. So typically Americans would decorate their homes on the 4th of July, but what happened with the tercentenary is that the commission provided for the decoration of the city. So the flags that you see, the flags that you see on the street are provided by the commission, but they also encouraged local residents and local business people to, to, there was like a competition to see who could decorate their establishment more, the most patriotically. So this is a slide which is not from Plattsburgh, this is actually from Rouse's Point. And, but it just shows you what 1909 streetscape would have looked like. The streets aren't paved, but at this point we've got two things are notable here. Sidewalks and fire hydrant. And the beginning of electricity. But what's interesting here is I just want you to note is that there were no outdoor lights in Plattsburgh in 1909. And one of the big features of the tercentenary that were boomed was that if you came at nighttime, the city would be illuminated. So when you look at this uh, picture, if you look uh, at the upper, uh, upper corner of it, you'll see that there's a, some strings of lights out on the street. Mm -hmm. And that was considered really high tech and really amazing. Isn't that great? It is great. And we'll see some more of the illumination uh, uh, in, uh, in some slides to come. Um, Corner of State and Lake. Is that in Rouse's Point? Yes, Corner of State and Lake Street. State and Lake you. Street. Okay. Yes, great. You know, I, I would love it if, like, some of these pictures I'm not exactly clear about locations and things, or even like who might be in the picture. So, if any of your viewers know some of these places or some of these people, by all means, let contact me at Plattsburgh State and let me know. Or, or if their grandfather is in one of the pictures, or okay. you that's know, very or, possible. It's very possible. Almost always happens when we do this. It almost always does, because uh, there's all kinds of pictures of crowds, and you might recognize sure. some people in the crowds. Um, well, public commemorations were really strongly supported by municipal elites for their potential to attract the attention of tourist dollars to their community. We know that in 2009 we tried to do the same thing, right? We wanted to attract tourists to uh, Lake Champlain, and so we, we made a big deal out of it. Civic boosterism played a big role in Plattsburgh celebrations. The city spent almost the first half of 1909 planning for the events, making infrastructure improvements like paved sidewalks that we see here in time for the so-called big week. The public decoration of the city was uh, 
was uh, covered by the budget of the commission, and then individual business owners covered uh, their patriotic decoration schemes. What I found out in my research is that the Common Council of the City of Plattsburgh intended to raise a special tax for the tercentenary. They wanted to raise $10,000 to pay for these decorations and for all these you know, uh, infrastructure improvements. This was not uncontroversial, as you can well imagine. Um, a lot of citizens felt that the city had more pressing budgetary needs other than uh, putting up flags and special lighting features. So a special vote was held on the question of whether or not this money should be raised. And right at the last minute, uh, citizens were given the option to approve the appropriation of a more modest amount of $5,000, which in those days was a lot of money, sure. right? Um, so on Tuesday, March 16th, the vote on the tercentenary tax was held. Turnout was heavy. The outcome was in doubt up until the very end of the day. And Plattsburgh's suffragists staged a demonstration. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they stage a symbolic protest because the women weren't allowed to vote. So they showed up with their hat pins and their, their signs. Great. Isn't that, a great, oh, isn't that yeah. a great little piece of historical uh, trivia? Right. So interestingly, the resolution for the $5,000 tax did pass by a hair's breadth. And the Moores administration, Moores with M-O-O-E-R-S, which was the mayor of the, of the time, went ahead and, you know, celebrated the Tristan Chenner using the money from the special tax, but in the following election, he was soundly defeated. <laughs> so, it's only right. It's only right. It's only That's right. Funny. Yeah. The citizens might have resented the imposition of historical commemoration oh, my, my. on their on their community. All right, let's have a look at how this is Rouse's point, but you know exactly where this is. Oh sure, downtown. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, isn't that a great shot? That's um that's the uh the it's, county courthouse. Exactly, sure. yes, it is, yeah. The county complex. Decorated with, the bun with all the bunting. So here you see some citizens pressing to see the tercentenary events. Look, you can see the streetcar railings in the foreground. Absolutely. They yeah. went all the way out to Bluff Point. They and did. the Hotel Champlain, by the way. Indeed they did. I happen to have two of the tokens in my pocket at this time. How sweet. How sweet. Do you, do you always carry tokens? I always carry those two as good luck charms. I think that's a lovely thing. <laughs> I think it's really, really wonderful. But I have a spike from the, ah, from the tracks when they pull them Nice, up. nice. So you can see how lavishly the buildings were decorated. And right up on the, in the middle you see a flag and it's a French lily, but it's kind of furled and you can't yeah, I can see, see it. it very well. Sure. Yeah. So here's here's what the city itself looked like. Um, so coinciding as it did with the Fourth of July, the city took on a gay and festive air, uh, the likes of which had never been seen before. The next picture shows you a rather remarkable scene. Um, can you figure out where this is? What what are we looking at in the central picture here? Do you, is that Bridge Street in yes, Pittsburgh? Indeed, sure. Yeah, that's the old bridge. The old Bridge Street. Yeah. Looking yeah. up right, from yeah. the lake. So this big commemorative arch that you see in the picture would have been what the commission provided to the city. Um, so the state of New York actually gave them quite a, a significant budget for this. They also got money from the federal government as well. So state and federal government believed that this celebration was a valuable thing for the nation. So this commemorative arch was put in place uh, in order to create a sense of civic spectacle and the goal of these kind of decorations was to transform an ordinary industrial landscape into a memorable stage for a street pageant. So somehow, you know, the, the cityscape had to be transformed into something more magical. Yeah. And this kind of archway would have, would have done the trick. So you've got, it says 1609, 1909. Can you see the French lilies in the upper corners mm -hmm. between the flags? And I think it was kind of cool how this worked out because red, white, and blue is the color of the American flag, the British flag, and the French flag. So the three countries whose history had been involved in the area, Lake Champlain, it was all red, white, and blue. So it was a big, you know, colorful festival where you could use all those colors uh, in harmony. So can you see, Gordy, that there's like, can you see on the extreme right side of the picture, there's a little string, string of electric lights? Yeah, sure. That was the big deal in those uh, days. I, of course it would be. Of course. And look, look along the string of lights goes up, and can you see the circular feature there? 
There's like a circular oh, yes. thing, yeah. and you can't really tell because it's too blurry. But inside that is an actual picture of Champlain in his canoe. Oh come and, on! And there are lights all around it. So, oh, my so this would have been lit up at night. That's big time. Oh, this was big time. This is high tech. So this would have been lit up at night for the pageant spectators to mill around in the streets and enjoy the nighttime l illuminations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't have a picture of it. I don't have a picture of this illumination at night in Plattsburgh, but I do have one for Burlington. I, it it might have been the same actual one that they shipped over to Burlington for the next uh, day, on the next day. So here we have what the city might have looked like. We'll see more pictures of what the actual, and look, Gordon, there are the streetcar tracks that you told oh, sure. us about going oh, yeah. right, out, right out to, to Bluff Point. So interestingly, these electrical features, uh, okay, the Tercentenary Commission covered the expenses of building three viewing stands, uh, one at the mouth of the Saranac River for viewing the floating Indian pageant, another at the intersection of Cornelia and Margaret Street for the viewing of the parade, and also at the old military base uh, for the viewing of the military exercises and the historical orations. Special electric lights like the one we see here were supplied by the commission but the city agreed to provide the power, free of charge. So, so you see this cooperation and collaboration in order for this to be a success. All right, let's keep going. Uh, the commission also produced, they wanted to ensure the success of their show. If they're gonna do all this stuff, they want people to come. So they have to like put out um, advertisements and flyers. So here's uh, one of the advertisements that I found in the Vermont, uh, University of Vermont um, Special Collections. And it shows you a kind of a program for the Tercentenary Week. And uh, it was produced by the New York State and Vermont Commissions, along with the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, uh, which offered special rates for Tercentenary guests. So if you came to the area from New York City, you would get a cheaper uh, train fare than you would ordinarily. So this was you know, trying to get people to come uh, and see this big show. So these kind of pamphlets were produced with the highest aesthetic standards on the best quality paper. And th these documents themselves were intended to be monuments of a kind, a kind of a permanent record of the valley, of the valley's most uh, spectacular commemorative events. And one of the things I thought interesting, that was interesting, Gordon, is that I actually found also like the first kind of road maps with showing that you could take your automobile and you could maybe drive from New York City to Lake Champlain. Imagine what that was like a hundred years ago. Yes, because there was no Northway. And, <laughs> you, and, and it's, it's also fascinating because driving or being in a, having an auto, automobile in 1909 was still not something that the masses had. It was really only rich people who could afford cars. Because the, the Model T was only just beginning to roll off of the assembly line. And you know most Americans didn't have cars in this period. But for the wealthy of New York City who had touring cars, who could withstand it, the question was, what were the roads like? Were there dirt roads, were there gravel roads, or were there macadam roads? So you had to kind of, you had to convince people that they could do touring by their cars during the tercentenary. That it wasn't, you know, you weren't going to run out of roads <laughs> somewhere north of Albany, that you could, you could make it to the region. Right, um, the celebration took place um, at the, also at the Catholic Summer School. Um, oh, sure. So the Catholic Summer School in 1909 had a real big, big season. Oh, absolutely, near yeah. Cliff Haven. What, yes. What is now Cliff Haven? Isn't it, kind, isn't it fascinating? I sort of see this place as a kind of a, a lost Atlantis or some kind of like, you know, like, a, like a, I'm always fascinated by cities or communities that have been destroyed, like, yeah. you know, uh, Pompeii or, you know, places that once existed but no longer do. And here's a postcard showing us uh, the Catholic summer school around about this time. Um, and it was a, basically, it was, they call it the Catholic Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. It was a place for, it, like I think it's important to note that the existence of the Catholic summer school was it was a way of showing that Catholics in America were not just industrial workers and you know working class citizens that 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 there was now a Catholic middle class in America and they aspired to a genteel culture and the Catholic summer school was all about coming from all parts of New York State and you know engaging in a series of summer classes and lectures and and social events which highlighted, you know, Catholic uh, culture and, and, and values. Um, so um, Catholic Americanism was part of this Champlain tercentenary. Let's go look at a really 
neat picture of President Taft arriving in Plattsburgh uh, for his uh, stay during the first centenary. You can't really see his face, but this is what they called the big man. Because, of course, President Taft, they always made jokes about his girth. Oh, golly, they sure did. And he seemed to take it very well. Oh, yeah. But I, I just want to impress upon you that the fact that the president came to town was a really big deal. Because think about the fact that there's no radio, there's no television. All people had ever seen of Taft were pictures maybe in the newspaper. So to actually see the great man in person was, would be a real thrilling thing. I mean, I think if President Obama came to Plattsburgh, we'd be pretty thrilled and we'd probably turn out for it. But imagine at this time, you know, it was quite an, an astonishing thing. And we had had a number of presidents here before and have had some since. So it wasn't totally uncommon for presidents to come here. We had that beautiful hotel. That yes, stayed yes. At. Didn't McKinley come here? Yeah, he absolutely yeah. did, sure. Yeah, I think the Hotel Champlain even had a McKinley suite, like he, the president slept here kind of place. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you're right. I think, well, it's interesting. Um, Taft had only recently been elected. So he was elected in 1908, so it was kind of like a get to know you tour, you know. But it's interesting. Taft was a, gr despite his girth, this man got around. He was, oh, a, he he was a great traveler. He, was, he, he went to Panama, he went all over the United States, he was constantly on the road. So I think someone needs to write a book called Taft, the Traveling President. I like that. Yeah, because someone wrote a book about some, someone wrote a book about Hoover, the golfing president. So, <laughs> oh. you know, so now we need ta Taft, the traveling president. So here he is arriving at the dock. There was a dock. My sources in the community tell me there was a dock um, down below the hotel that stretched way out, well, there like was. Wilcox. Oh, dock. certainly, and the steamboat stopped there. Sure, that was the big attraction on the lake. So it had to be a big enough dock for a steamboat. Oh, absolutely. So here's Taft. He has come from Ticonderoga the day before, where Fort Ty was, the restored Fort Ty, which was restored in time for the tercentenary, was opened officially by Taft, or at least the West Barracks, the part that had been restored. So Taft was coming off a day of you know, heavy speech making in Ticonderoga, and now he was getting ready to bring his really big show to Plattsburgh. And I just want to point out that the man in the foreground on the extreme right here is President Taft's personal bodyguard. His name is Archibald Butt. <laughs> no kidding. B-U-T-T. -T. Yeah. Fine looking gentleman, looks really good in a uniform. Absolutely. But I just think it's kind of interest, it's interesting to note that this Archibald Butt was one of the men who went, one of the gentlemen who sat on the deck of the Titanic and went down with the ship. Oh, no kidding. In 1912. <coughs> that, that's a wonderful <laughs> little tidbit of uh, historical trivia. Yes. I love it. So here you see him full of life and getting on with being the presidential escort. And who would know that within like three years he would go down with the ship. Yeah, so it's a, I think that's it's, a great it's story. Not, it's a great it, story. It, it's notable also that Teddy Roosevelt was here a few years before this event and several times after that when they had the, uh, the training on the former Plattsburgh Air yeah. Force Base. Yes, the Plattsburgh experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's yeah. Cool. Plattsburgh was a, quite, a, quite a significant place yeah. um, back, back in the day. Um, right, there he's getting ready to take part in the events. And there's the car, look at the old, that might be a loger, I'm not quite exactly sure, but. Our good friend, Dr. Tony Vaccaro would know from he, yes. 200 paces. Yes. He's such a fanatic <laughs> at the Transportation Museum with two loggers on display now. Well, you, you can tell him that if he wants me to come and give a talk about transportation during the tercentenary, oh, yeah. there's a whole talk just to be given about that. Yeah, he would love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he would. Um, here's uh, more shots of the same events or the same place, same dock. So if you look, if you look at the upper left uh, panel, that's uh, President Taft's daughter, Helen, came, as well as his son, Robert. But Mrs. Taft stayed in Beverly, Massachusetts at the summer home of President Taft because she wasn't feeling well. So Madame Taft was not with the president during this uh, 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 event, but his children were, and they stayed on the houseboat of Taft's friend Smith Weed, had a houseboat on the lake, and the kids stayed on the houseboat and had a good old time. Smith Weed, another very famous name in Plattsburgh history. Uh, yes. The well, Smith Weed Bridge. And yes. Uh, we'll, oh, we'll, yeah. see more, we'll see the president pose in front of his house in a minute. Down in the bottom corner is a fascinating part of the tercentenary, which there were actually visitors from Japan. 
And if you look at the visit, the bottom right-hand corner, you see a very diminutive man. Uh, the man with the uh, top hat, the small man with the top hat in the foreground, mm -hmm. and, and the yes. lady with the white coat, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's um, a J Japanese vi visitor with his, with his wife. Um, so there was people from all over the world who came down uh, for, the, for the tercentenary, official guests. Um, right, let's, let's keep going here. Um, the president went to the Catholic summer school to give a talk in the auditorium. And this building is not standing anymore because it's all been destroyed. Uh, but here is what the auditorium looked like right when the president was visiting. So he, it was packed so full that people were actually standing outside just but, you know, and listening on the outside or just being there because the president was there. Um, so the president um, came, like, it's interesting. I got a lot of really good information about what happened by looking at the New York Sun. New York Times was good, but the New York Sun was a tabloid, so you got a lot more juicy, oh, sure. a lot more juicy stuff from yeah. the tabloid. This is what the New York Sun wrote. So I'm piecing together the picture, what, what the newspaper said about it, so we can really know what was going on in this moment. President Taft went over from the Hotel Champlain in an automobile, accompanied by Captain Butt, his military aide, Governor Hughes, and his staff and other officials, including members of the Tercentenary Committee. Dr. McMahon, the president of the school, Governor Hughes, President Taft, and Cardinal Gibbons made addresses. When the president entered the auditorium, he was wildly cheered by the thousand or more people who had been packed into the little place. Everyone <laughs> had a flag. Can you picture a thousand people in that little building? Hard to do. Wow. Everyone had a flag which was waved with vigor and presenting a violent wave of color to the president as he reached the platform and turned to bow his acknowledgments. Oh, that's so, great. Isn't that great? But that's look, great. Gordon, look how, fun, look how fun this is. Here's the actual picture of what happened. And then somewhere in my research, I found this. Oh, my, my. It's like a postcard. And sure. Like if someone had seen this postcard, it just says auditorium Cliff Haven. They'd think, oh, that's, that's interesting. But they wouldn't really know that Great connection. there's a reason why this sure. photo was taken, that you know, the auditorium yes. was not always that busy. It's, yeah. This was like a great moment in history. It's when the president was visiting. So if you look at this, oh, perfect. isn't that That's great? Isn't, do you believe me when I tell oh, you that this is what that is? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah, I, love, I love the kind of the way that, you know, I don't know, art mimics his, art, <laughs> and art and life mimic each yeah, other. Sure. Yeah. So they colorized uh, the flags, and it, the whole thing's been colorized, but it's quite, it's quite beautiful um, excitement around the, around the Catholic school. Here is a rather wonderful picture, uh, which I found in the Clinton County Historical Archives, who very generously allowed me to look at their collection. And the clinic, many of these archives have pictures, and they don't, they're not, pictures haven't been well preserved, or they don't know what they are. Sure. You know, we've got a great photo, but we couldn't tell you what year it was. We spent a lot of time on this camera trying to determine what those are and begging people to call us if they knew. Yes. Yeah. So I found this picture. It's got, it's got some quality issues, but it's still a really uh, magnificent picture. What, this, what I realized this is, um, on July 4th, uh, the 4th of July in 1909 happened to be on a Sunday. And in those days, Sunday was a special holy day, so you couldn't have a parade on a Sunday. So you couldn't actually have your 4th of July parade on 4th of July. That had to wait till Monday the 5th. So on July, Does that sound familiar? So on July 4th, they, they decided to kick the week off with what they called Champlain Sunday. And what this meant was, was that there would be special masses held throughout the valley. And what this picture is, is a picture of the Hotel Champlain guests, they had a special mass, uh, a pontifical mass held in the outdoors right next to the Hotel Champlain. So do you see the tennis court in the upper, upper right hand corner? Yeah. So that would be the tennis court of the Hotel Champlain. You can see in the center background that there's an altar that's been set up and there's a pontifical uh, flag, the white flag there next to the tree. So this is, now I know that this is July 4th, 1909, Hotel Champlain. Uh, and uh, it's quite a lovely picture, and you know it's interesting, Gordon. Look at look at the picture, and look at the predominance of female worshippers. Oh sure. Look, there's a little group of men at the bottom, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and the rest is all like ladies, kneeling down. So this caught the imagination. Uh, there must be more there than meets the eye. I wonder. It almost doesn't look like Hotel Champlain to me. 
Oh, but it Does is. It, Calvin, doesn't it look like Isle of Mott? A what? little bit? There wouldn't be a tennis so court, cool. though. Yeah, well, I don't know. It does look like Isle of Mott, the back, the back with the cedars, yeah. but, but it could be. It is, I think so. It yeah. Is, yeah, I think so. And that might be Velcro out it's there. It's fun to speculate. It's fun to speculate. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, I can't, you know, I can't give you 100% guarantee, but I would, I would, but I'm, I think if it was Isle of Mott, the crowd would have been more diverse. Yeah, maybe you're right. You would have seen, like, soldiers. You would have seen uh, more men. Uh, I have pictures of Isle of Mott too, so. Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> but you know what, Gordon? This is the thing. It's all, uh, if, if someone doesn't write on the picture what it is that it is. How often have we talked about this? How many pictures in the drawers in our homes are. are yes. And we, we, we people, chide other people about it, yes. and yet we have thousands that are unmarked. Yes, I tell my mom, like, please, you know, she please does it. Do. Please write on it who this is. Oh, absolutely. You know, what, what's going on. For posterity. Exactly, exactly. So Catholic summer school, uh, it was a, a, a big deal as well. Here's a picture of, this is the Reverend McMahon, another picture that I got from Clinton County. And once again, not 100% sure this is the tercentenary, but I'm betting that it is. So can you see there's a man with a, a, the black suit with his arm raised? I think that's the Reverend McMahon leading some kind of uh, song or some kind of anthem or some kind of you know, oration. And I think these are tercentenary guests who are gathered on that special day. Uh, everything, everything leads me to think that. You know, the sense of excitement, the sense of people standing on the roof because it's a really important moment. Um, it's more than just, you know, the 4th of July. And when President Taft, this is another wonderful picture, uh, when President Taft um, came to Cliff Haven, his speech noted the need for religious tolerance in America. And this made headlines. I mean, when Taft was in Plattsburgh, it was front page news in all the newspapers in America. And his speeches were printed on page one. And that, on that day, the headlines on, in, were like all over New York State and all over America, the headlines were President Taft calls for religious tolerance. So the mere fact that Taft sits on the, uh, this is the, the Champlain, uh, Club Champlain. The fact that he's sitting on the porch with Catholic dignitaries is a signal that America is becoming more tolerant of Catholics. It's going to take them some decades to elect a Catholic president. Oh, yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but things are beginning to change. Um, so uh, President Taft calls for religious tolerance. And the Champlain tercentenary seemed to coincide with the rising prominence of Catholic individuals in American society. And an increasing acceptance on the part of Anglo-Protestants of the Catholic citizens mainly French Canadian and Irish that now resided amongst them. So at Taft's left is Cardinal Gibbons. Um, and I believe um, there's an Episcopalian Bishop, Arthur Hall of Vermont with him as well. And to his right is Governor Hughes of New York, who I believe was Catholic, because why else would he be here? Uh, there's Bishop Arthur, um, wait a sec, there's, did I already say Arthur Hall? Yes. Monseigneur Rassicot uh, from Montreal, our auxiliary bishop. And standing behind Car Cardinal Gibbons is Adolphe Lemieux, Canada's postmaster general. And standing in the rear, second to the right, uh, right by the flag and the pillar, the man with the white, whitish hair and the handlebar mustache, is none other, none other than Louis Lafontaine of Champlain, uh, New York, one of the commissioners. So uh, it's possible to figure out who some of these people are. So the, the intense looking man in the white vest, like the tuxedo there, with, with the sharp hairline, that's Adolphe Lemieux, the postmaster general of Canada. The Prime Minister, uh, Louis, um, the Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier was supposed to come, but he couldn't make it. So he sent his postmaster general um, as his representative. So that's a famous picture of President Taft posing with Catholic dignitaries. Here we go. Here's the, what the streets of Plattsburgh looked like um, Monday, July 5th, uh, and then also the Champlain uh, celebration itself. Monday, July 5th was a 4th of July parade, but then on Wednesday, in the middle of Champlain week, the climax of the tercentenary was here in Plattsburgh. So here you see it, July 7th, the great crowd for the, this is when the president visited on the 7th. So the whole week had special days special commemorative events, but the big day was the middle of the week when the president was in town. So this is what the crowd looked like. The city had to hire special police. 
The city put out warnings, the newspaper here put out warnings about beware of pickpockets and petty criminals because of all the crowds that came to Plattsburgh. So I really like this picture because I, I like the photographers on the tops of the buildings. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're probably making stereopticons, you know? Probably were so. We were just talking about those last night. The great old photographs still exist. Yes, they're very, they're very, yeah. very useful. So here we see um, what, the, what, the, what the crowds looked like um, um, at, at the time. Um, the New York Sun uh, described it as the one night show of the tercentenary celebration and that it arrived in a small town on the shores of Lake Champlain. So the big show had come to Plattsburgh and the citizens were ready for it. And have a look at uh, some, of the, some of the parade, parade activities. So military troops from the entire country, this, from Vermont, from New York, all kinds of, you know, uh, New York State militia, uh, uh, militiamen, the National Guard of New York State, uh, troops from all over within you know, the distance from New York to Plattsburgh, they all converged on Plattsburgh and camped out on the base. So the newspapers were saying that Plattsburgh had not seen so many soldiers since the War of 1812. Only now they were coming in peace. So here we see a kind of marching band coming down. Uh, hard to tell what street this is. Could be Oak Street. Uh, I can't really, I can't really, um, I can't exactly peg it. I love this picture though because it captures the moment. And look at the little boy running in the bottom. Isn't, Isn't that, that great? Yeah. Yeah, it could be Oak Street. It could be Oak Street. You got to wonder what's going through the mind of that little boy who's running. There's other boys in the background and they're sort of running along with the parade. And to them it must have been, you know, the, the sight of it and the, the sound of it must have been really exciting. So when I presented this to the Clinton County Historical Association, we were speculating as to what these uniforms were. Any guesses? I, I, I can't really... I would say that's a band uniform based on having been in a lot of marching bands. But they seem to, um, have, they seem to have weapons, though. Or I can't, you know, I can, I'm looking at a monitor on the side. It's not something I'm familiar with. Me neither. And what's the crest on the front? It seems like there's a C and an S and a H in there. Oh, really? Is that what that is? No, I can't tell from here. My mid-range it's, it's not. It's not Knights of Columbus. It's not Salvation Army. Um, they seem to have weapons, though. So I'm, oh. <laughs> I don't know. If there's well, any military uh, experts in the audience, if they could contact us and let us know yep. who they think these people are. Good point. Yeah. White gloves, uh, very impressive shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and of all the soldiers that converged on the city, uh, the Royal Highlanders from Canada came down, and they were the most popular of all the uh, of all the all the marchers because of their uh, rather their scarlet tunic tunics and their you know giant uh, giant fur hats. This is Canada's fifth Royal Highlanders, <laughs> oh, followed yeah. by the Governor General's foot guards. Uh, the tercentenary re report remarked that, quote, the New York tercentenary parade in Plattsburgh on July 7th brought together perhaps the most interesting body of troops ever seen in the region. Uh, note the string of electric lights to the right, and uh, you can see them really clearly here. Uh, it's not a very good shot, though, but it does give you a sense of... I think this is coming down Bridge Street, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the arch that I showed you earlier. Sure. Yeah, that's the far, the far end of it. Um, this is a much better quality picture. Uh, this is turning from Bridge Street uh, going north on Margaret Street, yes? Mm -hmm. And what I like is you can see in the foreground that there's some historical reenactors dressed in revolutionary... Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. The next, now these, these beautiful uh, pageant floats, uh, what you see in front of them is the fort at Isle of Mott, Fort St. Anne at Isle of Mott, uh, a Catholic uh, pilgrimage site. So that $5,000 tax that they raised was spent on these floats. So maybe that's why the, the, the mayor got turfed out of office because the floats were really quite spectacular, and, but they cost a lot, but the taxpayers weren't too happy about it. So I like the picture because it gives you a sense of the crowds pressing like 10 deep, uh, to, you know, the streets being really full. So right at the corner of Cornelia and Margaret, there would have been a, a viewing stand there for the dignitaries to see the parade. Uh, interesting, there's a little sign, what does it say? Cars, st 
Look, look how interesting it is. There's a sign right in the center of the picture. It says, cars stop here. Oh, I, didn't, I can't see it from here, yeah. but I... But, you know, it, it's interesting, Gordon. They didn't yeah. have the standard yeah. stop signs yet. Sure. Because driving or automobiling was still kind of like disorganized. Yeah. So if you were an automobile and not a horse and buggy, you needed to stop here. I love <laughs> There's all these stories about how people, oh, you know, yes. there were, uh, uh, people getting in accidents because cars were out of control. So this is interesting. This is a beautiful shot of Bridge Street coming down. Uh, and what we see here is a view of the parade. Uh, and you see in the foreground a float showing Champlain's caravel, the Don de Dieu. Of course, he would not have brought that ship down into the lake because, as you know, he had to paddle his way down. But he did cross the Atlantic in a caravel, so this ship was, sh was showing him. Um, and the New York Sun noted that on this special day, the Champlain reenactors were everywhere. This is what the New York Sun wrote of the parade floats. So look at the picture and listen to what the newspaper reporter observed. Here's what he wrote. Quote, Champlain appeared in most of them. It was remarkable how his appearance changes in the course of a few feet. There were big and little Champlains and thin and fat ones. They all wore, they all wore Champlain whiskers in the accepted fashion so that one could tell readily who was meant by the representatives. First came a replica of Champlain's ship, the Don de Dieu. Champlain sat in the stern sheets, and four red-capped Frenchmen were in the waist of the ship as the crew. Then came Champlain in a canoe with Indians. He was discovering the lake that bears his name. After that, his, his fight with the Iroquois, in which his arquebus showed up good and strong. Next was a representative of Champlain making a report to King Henry IV of France. After that was a representative of Father Jogues teaching the Indians Christianity. He held a crucifix before them and he was bowing the knee. Then came floats representing Fort St. Anne and Isle Lamotte and Carillon, the French name for Fort Ticonderoga. So have a look at, that's the actual float. And behind the, the, the mast, you can't really see him, but there's a plumed Champlain sitting there. And let me give you a close-up of it so you can actually see it a little bit better. Um, right here, can, you can see there's a Champlain with a sure. plume right there. Oh, sure. And can you see there's another Champlain up here? Oh, yes. Yeah. So those Champlains were right, everywhere. And their writing was so beautifully descriptive and flowery in newspapers then. Yes. So there's the original picture. And then if you, with technology now, you can like blow them up and get closer. So here we see at least two Champlains in succession. So. Champlain was everywhere. Interesting that you should choose that newspaper to describe this. It's so wonderful because the New York Sun, of course, is where the letter, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Yes, was Virginia. Yeah, yes. It. Well, it was more of a tabloid newspaper, so yeah. it, it gave you a lot more of the, the, the fun stuff that people like clamored for. So here's a picture of another tercentenary float. Uh, this one showing Father Joe converting the Indians. Um, so Father Isaac Jogue, uh, he was captured by the Iroquois and ultimately martyred by them or, or killed by them. Um, and for a lot of French Catholic Americans, they believe that, I, that J Father Jogue was tortured at Isle Lamott, and thus Isle Lamott was consecrated by the martyr's blood. Um, in March of 1909, Dr. Uh, Laroc, a local fr French Canadian uh, uh, immigrant, he was the head of the French Day Committee, and he traveled to Montreal to consult with the manager of the of the Beaulac Company for costumes for the event. So a lot of the costumes were uh, brought down from Montreal for this uh, event. So this is a really neat. This is a postcard, but what's good about these postcards is that the the maker actually wrote uh, on them what it was. So yeah. we would have figured it out anyway, but it's good. It's good to see it. This is another mystery picture, Gordon, that I would really like to know who these ladies were. These are uh, ladies in a, the 4th of July parade, uh, po possibly of 1909, but I can't figure out the costumes that they're wearing. And I figure, are these daughters of the American Revolution? Yeah, I have no clue. Or, or are these Salvation Army um, ladies? Because didn't the Salvation well, Army have the a... the caps look like Salvation Army, don't they? Yes. Didn't the Salvation Army literally, the, like when they were doing their events, have like costumes oh, on? Oh, so, like, so. Or military have, uniforms. Oh, absolutely yeah. they did. Or someone, someone raised the point that they could be suffragettes, but I don't think so, because they wouldn't be know. wearing a military-style no. uniform. Yeah. Nice. The riding side saddle. The riding side yeah. saddle, yeah. It's a, 
Well, I mean, I'm just intrigued by that. I kind of want to know who these people are. So th this, th and the next picture is, uh, again, the 4th of July parade. <laughs> but isn't this a great picture? That Uncle Sam. That's Uncle Sam. Isn't that the greatest look at that? And Dame America. Oh, my goodness. And there's some, a man in the foreground wearing a kind of revolutionary period costume. But it gives you a sense of some of the quality in the costumes that were used. First National Bank. Yes, and look at in the up in the upper windows. There's some ladies uh, in their shirt waists. Oh, sure, isn't that great? Watching the parade from above. Isn't that a, isn't that a great picture? Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> it looks better on our screen. I think it's not as washed out as it is on on, on the large screen. And here's just another picture um, showing that the parade, the actual parade uh, itself, was an opportunity for all kinds of different members of society to participate. And here we see the cigar makers of Plattsburgh. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're, they're boosting their union. Forget about Champlain and the Tricentenary. They just want to show that union-made cigars are the best cigars. So it's, it says union-made cigars, and it says booming the union on one of their signs. And I love this picture for everything in it, but have a look at the extreme bottom right where there's just someone who turned to face the just camera. Just turned. And, you know, they, uh, they, they made cigars in several areas around here, and we in the Clinton County Historical Museum has a wonderful cigar store in Dan. Yes. It sat on the streets in downtown Plattsburgh during that very time period. So. Yes, and isn't, that is, cool? isn't it interesting that we made so many things in Oh, so we lots of things. Yes. Yeah. Salt, we made pepper here, or we processed pepper. Um, I think we made pianos, uh, we made shirt waists, we made medical instruments. We I mean, made lots of things, musical instruments and cars. And cars. And, the, and radios, very yes. famous radios when radio first came out, they were mm. made here. So lots of things in Plattsburgh. And not to mention blades and... Baird clocks. Uh, that too, and Baird clocks. Some very famous clocks of which I have one. Yes. Clinton County Historical Museum has a nice one. Yes, and, and something tells me that 1909 for Plattsburgh, like a hundred years ago, this town I think was really economically and demographically and socially really at its high point. I mean, I think the economy was booming. There was prosperity, full employment. I think you know a lot of the positive energy and this desire to celebrate was all about the good feelings of the progressive era that things Absol were getting better. Ab absolutely, we were getting electricity, we were getting oh, sewers, sure. we're paving sidewalks. Yeah, the world is getting better. Yeah, and no, Plattsburgh was absolutely on the map. Its population was not much different than it is now, a little bit less than it is now. But you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And there were, that was a harbinger of things to come with yes. that Plattsburgh idea that you talked about that came yes. around uh, Very positive. Uh, a few years later. Yep. And yeah, and it's, it's, I think if you look at like business guides, like if you go to special collections here, they'll have like business directories from the turn of the century. Lots and lots of them. Yeah. And if you look at those business directories, you'll see like the, the innumerable amount of different kind sure. of businesses there were yep. here. Yeah, so I think that's, that's part of why it was such a, a positive uh, experience in all. This is a grainy picture, but I still like it because it shows delegates from uh, the French Canadian Fraternal Organization of the United States. So French Canadian immigrants to the United States had formed into a large umbrella organization called the Union Saint Jean Baptiste de l'Amérique. So Saint John the Baptist was the patron saint of French Canadians or French Catholics. And the St. John the Baptist Society was a kind of fraternal organization grouping all the, all the fraternal organizations of the Northeast of the United States. So delegates came from all of the Northeast, Franco-American delegates came to participate in this, uh, in this tercentenary event. And to some degree, these Franco-American delegates had a kind of parallel celebration of their own. They didn't travel, they traveled on different boats and in different conveyances. And uh, what we see here is the float of uh, Isle Lamotte, the Fort St. Anne of Isle Lamotte. It's on the U.S. Oval, and the de delegates are posed in front of it. Uh, but what I like to note is that for them, the tercentenary was about honoring the French and Catholic presence in the United States, which began with Champlain's 1609 voyage. And uh, Arthur Favreau's book, La Grande Semaine, uh, is all about the French-Canadian take on the tercentenary. 
And what it proves is that Franco-Americans at this point in 1909 were demographically at their height. I mean, immigrants had been arriving since the 1830s, but by the turn of the century, if you look at the population of, Frank, of, of, of the North Country, uh, maybe 50% of them were, were French, of French-Canadian origin, if not more. So they were really strong demographically, and they still had a really strong sense of who they were as a distinct community. And when they saw Americans celebrating Champlain, it was their way of saying to themselves, look, we're not immigrants in this country. Unlike the Irish or you know, the Greeks or people who had to cross the ocean to come here, we were here first, or we were the first Europeans to come here. We founded this nation. One of our people founded New York State. So for Franco-Americans, this was like a way for them to feel like they were truly 100% American. They weren't immigrants like other groups. So you could argue that this hastened their assimilation into the American mainstream. Because it hastened, it allowed them to identify America with Catholicism and with their roots. So I think it's a very important moment for them. And there's a whole story uh, to be told about what the tercentenary meant to the French uh, immigrants of the, er of the area. So here are some more of these Catholic delegates. Uh, this is uh, Jean-Arthur Favreau, the president of the Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste, posing in front of the pageant float of Champlain's Habitation. So you can see from this picture, it's on the US Oval, but you can see that um, the old military base, you can sure. see that fairly, fairly elaborate floats. Wow, very elaborate. Right, well, well, taxpayers were paying for it, so uh, it made it for a really good uh, uh, spectacle. Now, I'm about to show you that the president had lunch with Smith Weed, and at some point the president traveled through Plattsburgh, and he was, the streets of the city were lined with an honor guard, and I want you, want you all to have a look at it. So here is uh, Knights of Columbus and other, I uh, can't figure out who the other group is, but in the background behind the flag is the Knights of Columbus. So, does this look familiar to you? Oh, I'm trying to see. I'm sure you'll figure it out. If you had time, you'd be able to figure out where it is. I have another version of this, which is probably even more clear. Let's go look at the next one. Does it mean anything to you? I mean, you know where this place is. It's a famous house in the background. This is Brinkerhoff Street. Oh, and funny. right to the left of this picture would be the YMCA. And that's that old house that hasn't been painted in a hundred years. It's, it's wonderful, and some dear friends of mine live there, and I know the whole story. And Who lives there? Uh, well, um, you're going you're gonna to put me on the spot, and mm -hmm. I, know, I know her very well. Yes. Okay, I'm not going to put you on the spot, then. but you but know I the house. But I do know her very well. You know the house. Her husband is deceased, and her, her name is, is uh, Francesca Hartnett. There you go. And I call her is that, Seska. Is that her, Tim Hartnett's mother? And Tim is a mo very talented musician. Yes. He's also very much involved in the, in the Humane Society. Yes. But Seska is, uh, always has her finger on the pulse of this city, very involved in watching politics and once ran for office. She's a dear woman and she will never paint that house just so people like you will say, how come they never paint that house? God bless her for, for She's that. She's wonderful and it's a great house. God bless her for being eccentric and being different She's and not caring what people think. <laughs> She's my kind of people in, in every my way. My kind of gal, yeah. So that's that house. That's her house. Win. Isn't that a great picture? Oh my goodness, and I wonder if Seska's ever seen that. Before. She probably hasn't. Oh. Because, you know, I've been unearthing stuff from the most you I know, will tell her places. to watch this program <laughs> one way or the other. She's in if it. I have to hand deliver it to her. It's, yeah, it's a lovely picture. I'm so glad I thought of her name. Isn't that great? Well, no, because I put you on the spot. And that, that <laughs> may, I know how that is. People put you it. on the spot and you freak out and you go blank. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, as you talk about it, it comes back. That's great. So you see the men in the foreground, they have like the, you can see this is Knights of Columbus, because yes. it's written all over it. But what I, again, what I love about the picture is the men all in their uniforms with the white plume hat, they've got the flag, but look at the little boys in that little break right there that are just watching this thing. Of course, aren't they great? Now I wonder the, who these little boys are, maybe someone will recognize them, maybe that's someone's dad or who knows, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to note. So let's go ahead and look at when the president arrived, how, it, how he looked. There's, this is President Taft at the Smith Weed House. Look at that house. 
Look at that porch. Oh, well, he had a, the, the Saranac River, he had a beautiful park along the... With a fountain? Oh my yes. goodness, it was such a spectacular place. It was spectacular. Now this house is still standing, right? That's where the, the law firm is? Uh, yes, as I a believe. matter of fact, that's yeah. where the law firm was. It was the Post 20 American Legion. Yes. Uh, for some time, there was a large fire. It's, yes. You know, I heard about it. They right the on top the other of it, side yeah. of the bridge, and uh, then it was rehabilitated. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take just a little break. Very good. To decide what our next move will be. Sounds Stay good tuned. to me. Stay tuned for chapter two. <laughs> we will have a minute. We're going to have volume two, right? All right. Oh, we're on. I'll tell you what. <laughs> we had time flies when you're having fun is a phrase that applies. We, <laughs> you laughed when you said we'll never show a hundred slides. You won't. But we just got stuck on so many great pictures and so much wonderful information. I'm going to be floating out of here about six inches off the floor, and that'll be no mean feat for the size of this rather copious and opulent frame. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sylvie Baudreau, thank you so much for this first chapter oh, of the Tercentenary Story. We will come back to do chapter two. Yes. We do urge our viewers to give us information. Anytime you can fill in the blanks of any of these things, we'd love to hear from you. Calvin and I are tremendously accessible via our internet or telephone or email, whatever. But thank you so much for what you do. You are an exciting and wonderful person, and we'll be back. Thank you very much. You're welcome so much. It's my pleasure. It's our pleasure, too. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.